So I aspired to be Margaret too. Um, but for the moment, then I'm, I'm going to return now, however, to Margaret One and introduce uh, two senators, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Senator Susan Collins. And as we were going through the shutdown and we were getting um, proposals from the women, I thought, if only women ran the Senate, what a wonderful place it would be. <laughs> so I called Senator Klobuchar and Senator Collins and they agreed to come and, and agree with me, I hope. <laughs> and John, you're a guy, but please agree. <laughs> uh, oh, there, there is no question. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This is, this is a great thrill. Uh, I cover the White House now, but I spent many years running around uh, after both of you. And, you know, since I left, uh, the congressional approval rating has gone up to, I mean, Nine. it's almost 10%. No, it's, uh, it's below 10. Um, so, uh, so uh, but uh, great to have Susan Collins, Amy Klobuchar here. Hey, uh, Amy, I, I know I want to talk about the great bipartisanship you guys have, have managed to forge in a place that, where it's desperately needed. But we do have some news that just came out. Uh, the, the enrollment numbers for the first month of, the, uh, of Obamacare have come out. And as you know, they're not very good. 27,000 people is all that we're able to uh, not even enroll, but, but to, but to uh, choose a health plan uh, during the first month. How, how worried are you about the way things are going? Well, I think it is uh, no surprise that this has been an unacceptable situation. Uh, you have a website that's not working at a time when people actually do want to sign up and get their health care this way. So uh, the numbers that we saw were, I think, about you know, 25,000 from that federal side, significantly better from the state sides. Um, and then 975,000 people who have actually completed their applications and are ready to shop uh, for their plans. Uh, the president has pledged uh, to change this. He must. One of our Minnesota companies is leading the way to try to fix it, which I'm glad about. And I'm very hopeful uh, that these significant improvements will be made so people can sign up. And I, to step back a minute, uh, if people remember, originally uh, this idea of the exchange uh, was a bipartisan idea. Uh, the health care bill itself wasn't, but the, this idea was. It came out of the simple notion that individuals and small businesses should be able to pool their numbers, leverage their numbers so that they can get rates like corporations get because they were paying nearly 20% more for insurance. And that is the simple idea behind the exchange. As we have learned, the implementation is not that simple. And the hope is that uh, these improvements will be made so people can, can sign up for their health care. John, I have to uh, respond a little bit because I think that we're going to find that the problems with the website are the least of the problems with the Affordable Care Act. I was in Maine this past weekend and a small businessman called me whose insurance had been canceled because it does not comply with Obamacare. He's facing a 54% increase in his premiums. Another constituent contacted me because her insurance also had been canceled, insurance that she liked. She has a 19-year-old son with cystic fibrosis who has been treated his entire life at Boston's Children's Hospital. Under the new plan that the exchange is offering in the state of Maine, she can no longer take her son to the doctor who has treated him his entire life at Children's Hospital. So I think we're going to find that there are far bigger problems uh, with Obamacare than just the website. And, and we're starting to see, uh, I mean, Susan, I mean, you know, we, we saw Senator Feinstein uh, was talking about the number of people that have called her with similar stories. And she is now joining with Senator Landrieu and, and I guess Bill Clinton from the outside and saying there may be a need to change the law uh, to do something about all these people that are having their health insurance canceled. Are you gonna, are you gonna join that effort? Uh, well, first of all, I have said, if you look from the very beginning when this law passed, I was one of the ones voicing some concerns in terms of the fact that we were gonna have to make changes going forward. Uh, for me, one of the changes is the medical device tax. Um, I would like to see that changed, repealed, uh, because it is essentially a tax on manufacturing. That being said, uh, whether it is uh, doing what we can to make sure that people are protected and either have a better plan on the exchange or able to keep their own uh, insurance, um, I think one of the problems with making these changes uh, is that there's general agreement that we can't just throw out 
of the entire thing. People have gotten used to these benefits. They want to keep their kids on their insurance till they're 26. Uh, they don't want to be kicked off their insurance because they have pre-existing conditions. My favorite part of the bill, which is just the beginning, the delivery system reform. Uh, trying to bring those costs down like we do in Minnesota where we have literally high cost, high, low cost, high quality care uh, that is really a model for the rest of the country with the Mayo Clinic and other things. Maine also has good health care. And so the idea is to try to keep those things in and keep a strong bill while making some of the changes we're inevitably going to have to make as we go forward. And one of the problems has been, it's been so extreme in terms of repealing the whole thing, it has been very difficult to make some rational changes to what is a big bill. Well, I, I think that, it, and I know you really didn't want a discussion <laughs> on health care, but uh, I certainly agree with Amy that there should have been much more of a focus on health care delivery reforms. The biggest problem with the Affordable Care Act is that, that it does so little to rein in the cost of health care. And after all, the reason why we have people without insurance is because insurance is so costly. Unfortunately, the result of Obamacare is to drive up those costs for many middle-income Americans and small businesses and reduce their choices at the same time. So I, don't, I think there is a lot that could have been done uh, to expedite delivery reforms to focus on chronic illnesses, for example, in the Medicare program, we spend one out of three dollars on people who have diabetes, and yet our reimbursement system doesn't incentivize off physician offices to check on their patients with diabetes. We could do, there's so much that we could do on medical liability reform that every study shows would so, save money. So uh, before we, we leave health care, though, you, you, Senator Klobuchar, you're actually going to the White House tomorrow. You're going to meet with the president, you and the rest of the Democratic uh, caucus. W what are you going to tell him? I mean. Well, uh, first of all, we've had many discussions on this uh, with the president. And um, just to get at Susan's point here, one of my main arguments on health care has always been the delivery system reform. And when you look at the facts, we've actually seen uh, the slowest increase rate in decades to health care costs. You, their numbers are out there in the last two years because a lot of the hospitals and doctors are starting to respond to look at delivering health care in a more cost efficient way. So that is why many of us think uh, that those we have to keep in the good parts of this bill. Um, and to allow just to pull back on the exchanges now uh, when people finally have this opportunity to get uh, depending on what their options are for plans, some better deals than what they had. In some cases, that's not true. In some cases, that is true. And I think that what we need to see is improvements and working together rather than um, simply repealing the whole bill. You know, there what the big mistake in the first place is we should have worked together in a bipartisan way. Well, it was crazy, to, right, to, to, to pass a bill like this without a single and Republican. If we remember, we tried. Max Baucus <laughs> waited and waited. I, they tried to do it that way, I and really it was hard that to do. much as I love Amy. But <laughs> remember, the theme today is bipartisanship. <laughs> um. <laughs> but, but seriously, Amy and I share an interest in the health care delivery reforms because both of our states, long before the Affordable Care Act, have been leaders. The Mayo Clinic obviously is well known for that. Uh, Maine has several hospitals that have led the way. And there's a lot you can do. If you look at the Dartmouth College uh, Atlas of medical costs, you'll see that Maine and Minnesota are both known for high quality and lower costs. And high but, coverage rates um, for we people who are insured. We should have learned from that. And I think there was a lot that both parties would have agreed on that could have provided the basis for a bipartisan bill. And I think it's really sad that instead the bill was jammed through it's, it's hard Without to go back that and that kind of support. Okay, so I, I, I do want to move on, though. So I, I, I joke, 9% approval rating in, in the, uh, of Congress in the latest Gallup poll, a, an all-time record. But you two have managed to find a way to work together. And we, we were talking earlier, uh, you won re-election with a, a was it a 35-point landslide. I mean, this makes Chris Christie's race look like a nail-biter, right? <laughs> 
And uh, Senator Collins, you won 62% uh, of the vote in Maine, uh, significantly more than President Obama won the state of Wisconsin. Both of you way outperformed the president in, in your states. And more significantly, we had this whole shutdown debacle. And I've got a 17-year-old daughter who doesn't really pay that much attention to politics. But the one thing that she noticed and picked up on all this is that things started to change. There started to be a, a solution to come forward when you guys started to work together. It was, it was the women senators that kind of said, I mean, at least that was the perception from the outside. Tell me what was actually going on. Well, that's an accurate <laughs> perception. You have a very astute daughter, I might add. I mean, oh. and, uh, you know, the women of the Senate for years have gotten together for dinners. We get together about once a month, once every six weeks. And where, where do you go? What, what's the? Uh, well, we went to my house last time. It was yeah. lovely. Oh yes, we had uh, we had we had a potluck like in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Susan once actually sliced up a bunch of sweet potatoes <laughs> for, uh, for one of our meals. Maine potatoes. I quickly. Sorry. Uh, Maine <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> but but the point actually is a serious one, and that is that those dinners have forged bonds of friendship and trust among the women senators. And in times of crisis, such as the shutdown, that has been very helpful. I'll never forget being in my office on Saturday, October 5th, it was the end of the first week of the shutdown, and I was listening to the floor debate, and colleague after colleague on both sides of the aisle, alternating back and forth, were coming to the floor, casting political stones at the other side, and no one was offering a solution. So then and I there, well. <laughs> I charted out a three-point plan, went to the floor, gave that speech, and challenged our colleagues to come out of their partisan corners and stop fighting and start legislating. And it is significant that the first calls that I got just as soon as I got off the Senate floor were largely from my female colleagues. Amy was one of the first. Lisa Murkowski, uh, Kelly Ayod, and we built from there. There were a few good men, too. I want to make sure that they <laughs> John do get McCain. credit. And <laughs> John McCain, Mark Kirk, Joe Manchin, Joe Donnelly. There were, there were several people, Mike Johans, who helped out as well. But we started meeting day after day, and perhaps more important than the fact that the women led the way was the fact that it was truly bipartisan. We had seven Republicans, six Democrats, and my independent colleague from Maine, Angus King, and yeah. not a member of leadership, which I think might have been significant it, it, also. In fact, leadership kind of came in and swooped in and well, changed it, it all at the end. I, I, I don't want to revisit it all, but wait, it was, no, wait, yeah, we yeah, don't yeah. want to revisit the whole thing. Yeah. But the point was is that oh, we less. came together <laughs> and the basic framework that we agreed yes. on was basically what they did. We would have done a few things differently. There would have been some nice add-ons, if I do say so. But um, we were ready to announce our agreement and uh, they uh, worked with us. It wasn't, we were talking to them, so it wasn't like we were off on our own. But I think the bigger thing is just on this issue of the women and the leadership. Um, there's our group, but there also is the fact that uh, Susan led the way on the postal reform bill, still in the Senate that passed. Uh, Debbie Stabenow uh, is leading the farm bill on the Senate side, and remember that passed the Senate with big bipartisan support. Barbara Boxer was somehow able to get uh, with Senator Inhofe and work out an agreement um, on the transportation bill, and then with Senator Vitter um, on the uh, Water Resources Development Act. Patty Murray and Barbara Mikulski are leading the way um, on those uh, negotiations going forward. So the women in the Senate, while we're only 20% of the Senate, uh, we have an outsized role when it comes to um, some of these chairmanships and other things. I guess it's because we keep getting elected. Uh, okay. And to uh, sit in the chairman's, I'm chair of the Joint Economic Committee on the Senate side, so I get to go to these chairman's lunches. and. Um, to see all the women in leadership roles, it makes a big difference. And what Susan said is true. Uh, you look at the Violence Against Women Act, um, the women in the Senate, every single one of us voted for that bill. And that is what really broke the dam so that the House then really adopted some of the provisions in the Senate bill that were important to protect tribal women and other things. So uh, this has been happening time and time again. 
uh, where uh, things are going pretty bad and the women are able to step in. And I hope we see more and more of it in the future. And I especially hope we see it on some of these judge confirmations going forward. You know, forward. we're not letting uh, poor John yeah. speak here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, just one quick comment on that. Uh, Amy raises a really important point that there's a critical mass of women in the Senate now, but also women are in key leadership roles. Back in 2003, when I was chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, I was the only woman right. who was chair of a major committee. This is a sea change. And by the way, there are no uh, women chairmen uh, chair in, in the House, right? I mean, the House is... is I don't know the answer I, 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 I believe that is the case. So we're, we're almost out of time, but but how, how much of this, because obviously the, 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 the so much of what's behind the distaste with Congress and frankly the Washington generally is just that the, the two sides just can't seem to get anything done, can't work with each other. It's, it's what you described. We tune in, we watch you know, the blame back and forth and no effort at a solution. So given the progress, the clear progress that women that some of you women of the Senate have been able to do, how much of it is because there are more moderates like yourself, or the fact that you know you actually spend time together, these dinners? I, I mean, does, I does that make that a difference? I think that this uh, trust relationship where I have, where we know each other, uh, right. and we know uh, you know where we can find common ground and where we can't. It's like how Washington used to run. People actually knew about each other, they cared about each other, and I think that makes a major difference. I also think a lot of women that have gotten elected. Uh, we can't really get there by, you know, walking around in a flight suit, <laughs> and so <laughs> some of us have actually, but for the most part, it's a focus on results. When I was running for prosecutor my first time, I would obsessively look at Janet Napolitano's website in Arizona, even though she'd never met me, didn't know who I was, because she was focused on results. She would show what she promised and what happened. And someone once said that women candidates, um, and I don't agree with the first part, they said they speak softly and carry a big statistic, um, and I don't think we speak softly, but I do think we're more focused on those numbers and accountability and results, and I think that uh, makes a big difference, and I'm very hopeful as we add more women uh, to the Senate, and we have some opportunities in this next election, uh, that the culture can change. We did have, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, a traffic jam in the women senator's bathroom last fall. <laughs> it was a first, and we want to see more of that. So that is this just basic idea that you get people in there that like each other, actually you can get things done instead of standing in the opposite corner of the boxing ring throwing punches. Uh, you finally realize that courage isn't just that. Courage is standing next to someone you don't always agree with for the betterment of this country. You know, I I want to stress uh, Amy's very last point, and that is women span the ideological spectrum, just as men do. We don't think alike. We don't have the same positions on, on various issues. But where I see a difference is the women of the Senate are more likely to collaborate and to realize that we can disagree on an issue but still seek common ground. And that's what's changed in the years that I've been in Washington. There's been a reluctance to try to sit down, find out what's most important to the other side, and seek common ground. It used to be that those of us in the middle who sought compromise were lauded for our efforts. Now we're vilified by both the far left and the By some of your ride. own colleagues, right? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, just in the in the last minute or so we have left, I've got to ask you the the, the, the big question when it comes to women leadership. Hillary Clinton, you you Democratic senators, Democratic women senators, all signed to this highly secret uh, letter <laughs> that we all know about. Nothing uh, secret in uh, Washington. In, in encouraging uh, Hillary to run for president. Um, how hard was it to get Elizabeth Warren's signature on that uh, on that letter? I, I don't think it was very hard. I think uh, uh, people are very excited about the possibility of her running, um, and uh, so it was Which no one? surprise that we all signed the letter, including Elizabeth, uh, asking Hillary to run. So is this going to be just uh, she, by acclamation the Democratic primary? I mean, it seems like every. I mean, w w if, as long as Joe Biden doesn't Not get a vote. Not if you have a, a way about it, because it, it doesn't make good news coverage, huh? But uh, I. Uh, uh, I, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball on that, but there's clearly growing support for her. I just did the Arizona Democratic dinner on uh, 
Saturday night, and I've been around the country doing a lot of these things, and there's a lot of support, positive support for her. And if she doesn't run, Amy Klobuchar runs for president. No, I'll be working with Susan Collins on many bipartisan solutions. In the you Senate. noticed that was not a denial, right? I did. Okay, excellent. Uh, you noticed she's traveling all over the country. <laughs> did you get that? Did you pick that up? Hey, uh, a bigger margin than Chris Christie. All right, thank you very much. Thank Amy you, Klobuchar, Susan Collins. Thank you. Thank you.